You know you make me wanna shout and kick my heels up and shout and throw my hands up and shout and throw my head back and shout and come on now, don't forget to say you will. Don't forget to say yeah 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 yeah. Say you will. Say it right now, baby. Say you will. Come on, come on. Say you will. Say it, baby. Hello, this is episode forty-one of. For all that podcast, and this time we've got three guests. Andrew's with me as normal. How are you doing, Andrew? Yes, I'm splendidly well, thank you, Michael. How about yourself? Uh, a wee bit on the hungover side, but there you go. I'm also, we're also joined by Derek Bateman. Hello, hello. Uh, a former MSP, Carolyn Leckie, who's soon to become hello. a lawyer, I think. Well, <laughs> not quite yet, <laughs> but oh, hopefully I'll finish my degree in May. Uh, and uh, also by blogger William Duguid. How's it going, William? Hello, I'm, I'm fine today. Slightly hungover myself after the Dundee National Collective launch, but there you go. Ooh, was it good? It was good. 200 people and uh, lots of music. A few no voters as well, putting nice things on the wish tree. So that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I suppose our first topic this week, if you're all feeling genetically capable of talking about it, is the debate and the comment from Lament that seems to be causing such a fuss. I think first I'll probably go to Derek there. What did you feel about, first, the comment, and second, the debate? Well, I think the debate supersedes any comment because I didn't think it was a debate. I mean, I think at so many levels, I thought it was actually quite shaming for Scotland. I think it's one of these events where you, you just dread the thought that someone from another country would venture here and had to look at that and thought, so these are what, senior politicians? It's the first time we've had a head-to-head -head between our two most uh, senior female politicians. You know, I don't want to sound like a, an old git, really, but I was quite disgusted by it. And I thought, this is, why is it descended to this level at this particular time in our history? And I, I, I found myself thinking, if I'm an undecided voter, do you know what? I'm going to say, to hell with you. I have no interest in listening to this any longer. It just sums up the, the paucity of the quality of our uh, political classes. And I think we'll turn people off to the whole idea of politics uh, full stop. I thought it really did a, a, a real discredit to the whole referendum campaign. And if there is a winner from it, I would say it was the no side, because, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of sense there's a lot of people out there who are hovering a bit and they want to be inspired. They want to be pushing the back to, to make them vote yes. And I think that will just have turned them the other way, I'm afraid. Mm. And Carolyn, what were your thoughts on it? I didn't see all of it. It was unedifying. Um, I think it's been quite interesting, though, their reaction, because I've seen plenty of rubbish all-male debates on the telly. <laughs> um, and, you know, they continue apace. <laughs> you know, we haven't had any calls for there not to be any all-male debates because they all shout at each other. Because, you know, you just have to turn on Prime Minister's questions down in Westminster, and it's very similar, albeit with posher accents. So... There was a wee bit of underlying misogyny and sexism in the reaction, particularly from Ponsonby. Um, I can't remember what he said exactly, but it was fairly typical of him. Um, so apart from that, I mean, I wouldn't disagree that it didn't do any good. I'm not sure how many undecided people would have been watching it in the first place at that time of night. But I think what it reflects is the difference between people who are really embroiled in it and they're embroiled in detail and they're more likely to get annoyed and angry when things are misrepresented and when there's button in and all that sort of stuff. And it will seem a wee bit strange to people who are not engaged in it on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a lesson for anybody involved in any campaign or politicians is that they really need to step outside Mm -hmm. uh, physically and uh, psychologically really work hard to step outside and see themselves as others see them, you know, and, and, and try and reach out to people. Um, it, it who, can't, uh, it's, sorry, sorry. Can't, I, I don't want to make the same mistake that Joanne and uh, Nicola were making cutting across <laughs> you there, but uh, just <laughs> do you not think to a degree that this is the success of machine politics? Because what you have here is yeah. not a logical debate between two people, mm -hmm. whether they're, yeah. whatever their gender. What you've got are people being schooled. They are being told, this is your approach. This is how you do yeah. it. Yeah. And Nicola was I very definitely. successful in, yeah. in, in, with our previous debates. The Labour obviously decided the only way to counter it was to do the same thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and the people end up... Uh, my point is the people are the ones who suffer from it, you know? Yeah. No, definitely. I don't think it's the way to do things. I mean, and it's... 
it was a big reason why women for independence formed in the first place because we thought there was a better way of doing things and that that way of doing politics was never going to inspire or engage the vast majority of people most of whom don't vote now really you know and particularly women so the discussions that we have are the total opposite of that and they're a real antidote but I wouldn't blame Nicola and Joanne I think it's right they're being told what their line is and all the rest of it but I think it's particularly difficult for women involved in politics in an all-male environment that's very adversarial Mm -hmm. and they get socialised into being like that and it's almost as if to be heard you end up having to be more aggressive you know more loud than the men because that's the environment you're in you know are we being a bit unfair to Nicola Sturgeon because I noticed with Laman and with Sarwar I think there was a definite attempt they thought we're probably going to lose the debate on the issues so it's just a spoiling tactic we're just going to ruin the whole thing did you not see there might that might have been actually a bit of a deliberate strategy I think so and I think the the whole better together strategy is really anti-democratic which was the main point I was making in the opinion piece that we managed to get in the Scotsman yesterday that is anti-democratic, it's about shutting everything down. There's no doubt that was a deliberate tactic. And, you know, I'm try, trying to be objective. I think that Joanne was much, much worse than Nicola. And then Nicola reacted to how how bad it all was. And I think Nicola was at least trying to answer questions, but, but wasn't he being allowed to. It, but it did descend to be look like it was both of them. And without the background knowledge about the politics and the strategy and all the rest of it, I don't know how easy it would be for undecided people to see who was the, who, who was the good woman and who was the bad woman. Should the politicians not think about challenging the broadcasters? I mean, you know, good luck to, to Scottish for, for coming up with these debates. It's the, I think it's the right idea. But the rules that they're laying down, perhaps, are also leading to this type mm-hmm. of uh, 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 challenge. Because, I mean, it was presented in an adversarial way. I mean, mm-hmm. it, they talked about the two, uh, you know, top women crossing swords. Well, I didn't see any claymores. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe that would have been better television. But there is an issue here about how the media present it. If you just sit down and say quietly to two people, could we talk about our country and its future? Now, that's not going to sound sexy when you bill it. But actually, that could be something that people could relate to rather than what we got, which they've deliberately made adversarial. And actually, with their two experts, it sounded like it sounded like a wrestling or a boxing match to me. Yeah, that is the style, isn't it? And now we cut away for the expert commentary, <laughs> yes. um, and it's, it's exactly like that. And who won on points, and and it amplifies. I've said on this podcast before some of the worst aspects of the uh, way that the Americans do their politics. That you don't ask, well, what are the issues? What are the arguments? Let's step back and have an even audible discussion about what those might be and how we might disagree instead of doing that you talk about who won who won the debate um and you think well and if winning is totally detached from the content of what people were saying but is Mm -hmm. is, it hinges entirely on you know who is the chalk outline left on the floor i think that produces this ludicrous kind of exchange i it was interested i think i think i agree with much of what derek and carolyn have said but one thing i was interested in is because that joanne was in a sense, it was a, a moment for her to put herself before at least a section of the people and to represent herself in a particular way. I was interested to see what lines she'd been given, what kind of attack lines she was pursuing. And I thought the stuff about the genetically modified stuff was ludicrous. And I said as much mm-hmm. on Twitter, the idea, well, particularly the, the reaction that many Nats had to that, it was pretty clear what she was saying was, uh, to my mind, that Scots are not inherently more left wing, which is probably a yeah. proposition I can get behind. Um, but what was more interesting to me was the rather more problematic nature of her actual attack line throughout the entire evening she was clearly schooled and directed to to attack Nicola as if her argument for nationalism is fundamentally about ethnicity or has a slight racial tinge to it it was an argument about about that you'd be a you'd be for independence whatever happens whether it be lying in the gutter whether you're rich whether we be before you'd be for it nicola you'd be and i think that was really interesting that that's a move by the labor party to shift the debate from the terrain of powers 
and, uh, mm -hmm. and and democratic choice, which is where the SNP is situated it very strongly, to a preferred opponent, a preferred kind of nationalism for Labour to oppose, which says, well, you know, basically all of these people are really a bit bonkers. And the whole CyberNat story plays into the same idea that basically Scott Nats, whether they pretend to be social democrats uh, on the surface, whether they talk to you about the bedroom tax or powers, what the Nats are really interested in is flags and anthems, and they're all just lying to you. And I think that was interesting to see Joanne pushing that so insistently throughout the entire uh, exchange and cross exchanges of that rather muddy and an unintelligible debate. Back to yeah. the 70s, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I yeah. suppose that, that tells you something significant as well about the, mm -hmm. the Labour imagination, yes. Mm -hmm. Desperately trying not to talk over everybody here, but the, uh, actually, sadly, I agree with just about everything everybody <laughs> has said so far. And uh, it's particularly interesting uh, point of view there from Andrew. I, I do think that this is increasingly the, the Labour line of attack. I think these formats, you can partially say it's a format problem. Yes, good on STV for bringing it up, but then making it all adversarial and sword crossing and bashing each other's heads in, and the chalk outline, that, that, that's a great thing. You can say it's a format problem, but I, I really think that you're not going to get the undecideds brought over anyway, even if there is a chalk outline, a clear <laughs> chalk outline, because they'll feel sympathy for the loser. Uh, and certainly when it's just a big rammy, you're not going to get any sort of serious thinking if you are an undecided. So it's a bit of a circus and it's a bit of a sideshow, whatever happens, and there'll be many more of them. And um, I'm sorry to tell you that even in the event that David Cameron uh, agrees to debate with Alex Salmond somewhere in a parallel universe sometime, <laughs> that's going to come out just as unsatisfying. I, I really think it is. The thing that's going to bring undecided people over is, is going to be knocking on their doors and talking to them and meeting them at events and ordinary people speaking to them about the issues rather than this constant politician schooling that they get so you know it happened uh, it, it wasn't great Nicola was between a rock and a hard place because I suspect she wanted to give Joanne enough rope to hang herself and then felt towards the end that she just had to go in there because she just wasn't getting a word in edgeways properly but uh, at the end of the day I don't think it's going to matter all that much no. Mm. There, was, there was a nice thing, Michael, which is just, just sorry to cut in, but somebody pointed this out to me the other night that um, Nicola was to some extent trolling Joanne even with what she was wearing um, I don't like generally talking about what women are wearing but wearing a, a big powerful red bright scarlet trouser, uh, kind of suit uh, to debate a Labour politician uh, yeah. that's quite a that's quite a strategic garment selection by Nicola I think there mm. Well, I was going to say, there was one thing I thought Sturgeon could have done better, because during the week I also listened to another debate, which on a completely different topic. You may or may not know who Daniel Ellsberg was, the man who released the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. uh, a way back. Mm -hmm. And he was interviewing, uh, he was debating someone from the National Security Agency who who just continued to, to try and filibuster in the way, much the way that Lament did. And the way he dealt with it was brilliant. He just said... OK, have you finished your filibuster? OK, thank you. Now that you've finished, I can speak. And, you know, and Sturgeon didn't quite manage to do that. He, like, he was a consummate professional in just stopping the guy mid-flow when he was trying to spoil the debate. Mm -hmm. And she kind of she got sucked into it and, and just went for it. And it made the whole thing unwatchable. She could perhaps have done that a little bit better, I thought. Um, but the other thing is, with the genetics comment, I mean... It wasn't what she meant to say. It was pretty stupid. But what worries me more about uh, Laman is some of the other things she says, like when she describes nationalism as a virus. I think that was a much more worrying comment, and that's something that she clearly did mean to say. She hates the very notion. There's no doubt about it. I mean, partially it's, partially it's personal hatred, I suspect, uh, and it, it may be thwarted Labour Party ambition somewhere down the line with, with the SNP. But, yeah... <laughs> I've forgotten where my point was now, but I'll just <laughs> rant on for a while and somebody can talk over me. Why not? Yeah, but the only, the only nationalism the Labour Party seem to have a problem with is Scottish nationalism, whether you call it Scottish nationalism. don't have a problem with British nationalism. Mm. Well, I, mean, I don't know they, about that. Do they? I mean, uh, one of the well, things I think is quite interesting is the extent to which British nationalism doesn't want to think about itself as such. Um, often you get Orwell quoted, and one of his more obscure essays about the difference between patriotism and nationalism, and I'm a British patriot and you're a Scottish nationalist, and nationalism is bad. I wonder if there is such a yeah, clear... That's refusing to acknowledge that it is nationalism. It's, you know, it doesn't get discussed because it's just there. Mm. That is the hegemony. Mm. So they get yeah. to talk about Scottish nationalism as if 
the UK or Britain or whatever you want to call it isn't imposing its national identity on everybody else. You could hardly get anything more nationalistic than the, the main parties and the civil service uniting to tell so, another part of, uh, of uh, the country that actually it's our currency and not yours. Uh, the reserves in the Bank of England belong to us, but they are not yours. And by the way, you'll need to pay up your share of the debt. You'll have the liabilities, but you won't have any access. I mean, I would have said that was extreme nationalism. If you take the kind of economic argument out of it, that is nationalism to me. That is the worst kind of nationalism. I find it deeply ironic, uh, because I was discussing this earlier on today as well, this idea that um, uh, Scotland, you know, should should somehow be left with nothing from the union. I think what's happening is they're unravelling their own argument. I mean, if, if you are a union, then you have to say, look, these things are shared. And if at the end of the day you vote yes, you know, we will see how we can accommodate each other because that mm-hmm. will be the reality. But that's the idea of a family, uh, you know, breaking apart, having having a, a dispute. But you still care about the other side. The exact opposite is what we're now hearing. What they're saying is this has never been a partnership. It's mm-hmm. never been a union. And for mm-hmm. us, you're just a bolt onto our country. And frankly, if you don't do as we want you to do, we're going to punish you. And and that idea of, you know, we we're laughing earlier on this morning about the, the dam busters quote from the coalition about this latest stage of their campaign. But of course, the, the dam busters, the, the actual name for the operation was Operation Chastise. And that seems to be to be very historically appropriate for what they're trying to do now. <laughs> That's true, though. I mean, I've wondered about this for a while as well, about, I mean, the dam buster and the bounce from the love bomb to the to just the bomb. I don't know whether it holds together in the way that in, in the way that you're say, suggesting to the Derek there. I mean, I think that there is a problem about saying we feel very much together. You are very important to us. But here's a series of threats and menaces of one sort or the other. It's a very uh, an odd image of a family. And I think it does, to, at least to some extent, um, undermine this idea of a warm, convivial family union. That it's not just a love bomb, it's just, you know, the bomb. Um, and I think that's, I don't know how you hold that together if you are a pro-union person who feels well, strongly. I, I... I think this is a legacy. I think this is a legacy issue because the the way they have gone now, the route they are going down, will at the end of the day, no matter how uh, we end this with a yes or a no, this is going to last because we're going to have to re-examine exactly what our role is in the union. Irrespective of what the Labour Party come up with for, for the constitutional architecture, we have had revealed to us here the naked heart of the British state and how it actually, truly, truthfully views the Scots and I think for a lot of people, that is going to stay afterwards. They are building a reservoir of resentment, which will be there. Even if they win, it's actually not going to go away now. I think they've made sure of that. It totally reinforces the analysis that Scotland was absorbed um, yeah. by the Act of Union. And, and then they've tried to pretend, particularly in the 20th century, that it's a par- partnership of equals. But their tactics now and their statements now about the currency is ours, this is ours, this is ours, this is ours, all fits with an analysis that is the real analysis that Scotland was absorbed by the Act of Union. Mm. Is there also, I mean, because you're talking about that in quite strategic terms there, Carolyn, about intention and sort of calculation to some extent. But I wonder if there's also something a bit more unconscious going on. I mean, there have been times in the Scottish history since 1707 when there has been more of what we might think of as a union imagination, which isn't just about incorporation, isn't about a unitary imaginary British state, but it's about a kind of more of a union. And I, and I think across a whole range of different political areas you can see in the British politics, the slow atrophy, a very rapid atrophy, I suppose, increasingly of this idea of a, a union state. I mean, all of, like, for example, Ed Miliband's One Nation patter sits very uncomfortably beside the, the official story about a family of nations or mm-hmm. thinking about the UK in that way. Um, so I wonder if it's in addition to kind of doing it deliberately, there's also perhaps a reflection of a kind of less conscious way of seeing the British state as being increasingly unitary, despite the existence of devolution, a strange paradox, but one I think of our time. I, I just wish they had worked that one out. Uh, it, it may well be that this is this is an unconscious thing that's going on, what, what, what Andrew was just talking about there. But I, I think that their thinking is just far too short term for them even to be taking that on board. I agree with Derek that whatever happens now, the union is never going to be the same again. Whatever kind of union it may have become and whatever they may wish it to be, it certainly isn't going to be that. 
And I'm really not sure what happens after a no vote. And it, it does worry me. I, I think there is going to be a yes vote, fortunately, but <laughs> the consequence of a no vote really does concern me about uh, where we stand uh, and uh, mm-hmm. how we react as a people if it goes on, if, if our wish is frustrated. It may well be very similar to what happened after the initial devolution referendum in 1979. Um, And, do you know, if there is a no vote, I think a lot of people who vote no because they're either not convinced or they're they're just a wee bit frightened to take that positive step and they're not sure, so they're not not making a positive decision to vote yes. Probably quite similar to people who voted no Mm -hmm. in the first referendum, but then there was a learning process, a very difficult process. A very quick process. learning process. <laughs> yeah, a very quick learning process and a very difficult learning process after that. So I don't mm. think it would be the end of the matter, you know. I do think mm. it would be uh, we are in a process, whether there's a yes vote or not in September. That's my optimistic view. I just hope <laughs> we don't have to suffer too much to, <laughs> to get to the other end. I, I was just going to say, I think there is going to be a problem, though, because we will have promises coming from the other parties about what they want to implement to try and enhance and improve devolution. Uh, my fear is that uh, the view of the, the English electorate in general, but particularly the kind of, you know, the, the, the London uh, section of that, is going to be very anti dealing with uh, Scotland in a positive way uh, after the, the referendum. Mm. Uh, I think we will go into a kind of uh, scorched earth mode uh, as far as they're concerned. It'll be very difficult to get anything through the Commons, which offers Scotland more. And I think you'll find that if we're going to have UKIP people, possibly, in the uh, the Mm -hmm. future British Parliament, with an increasingly right-wing Conservative government, you will, I think, begin to hear people saying, we need to start dismantling, not building. We need to make sure this can never happen again, that the Scots were given the right to have this referendum, look at the problems that it caused. Britain as a state was deflected from dealing with the economy and austerity. It was sidetracked by this this issue of, uh, of independence. And we need to remove some of the powers to stop this happening. And I've got a suspicion that what we're going to see from the Labour Party, there will be some enhancement, I'm sure, for Holyrood. I think they will want to take powers away from that power source and put them into local government. I don't have an issue with that in kind of principle because I think we should have much, much stronger and more diverse local government. But I think they will try to do that in order to neuter Holyrood. Yes, and that will be a hard thing to argue against because in principle it sounds like a good thing. It's just the small print that's going to be the neutering Hollywood, Hollywood bit that's, that's going to be the issue. And they'll be able to push it through on the basis that people just take it at face value. Mm. I was actually this interesting question I'd like to hear what you all think about I was talking to one of my pro-union friends the other day and we're talking about the likelihood and and scope of any powers that might be devolved either by the Tories or the Labour Party and uh, this unionist was making the point that actually given the current state of the Labour Party that it may be that the Tories are actually a better vehicle for Scots to achieve greater powers than Labour Party are just to explain very briefly why, why why this argument was made I suppose it was because of this one nation idea, sharing welfare, pooling those kind of issues means that the Labour Party is in its guts not really very disposed to the idea of having different treatment across the country, whereas the Tories potentially don't care. They don't particularly care about what goes on in Scotland and they could do a deal with uh, with the devolved parliament with a view to reducing the number of Scottish MPs, for example, in a way which says, well, sure, let Scotland govern itself. We're not all that bothered about many of these issues. Be more left-wing if you like. You'll only screw yourself over. And, and, and therefore, perhaps paradoxically, he suggested that the Tories might be a better bet than the Labour Party are when you have your Ian Davidson stomping around and a whole range of kind of dinosaur Labour MPs that hate their colleagues up in Holyrood. What do mm, we think but- about that? Well, but can I just say that they actually had their chance to do that. I mean, that was there was a very strong rumour from Downing Street not so long after Salmon got his, uh, his majority, which said that Osborne was the leader of a small group who said, look, let's cauterise this problem of Scotland now by giving them basically what they want. Not independence, but Salmond is malleable on this issue, and that is true. He is and always has been utterly pragmatic. You give the Scots what you feel is enough to satisfy them and make it go away on the basis that you don't now need to have a referendum or you, you know you delay a referendum at the second term or, or some way of getting it out of the way. And basically, 
that the line was from these these this cadre of people they didn't care really what happened to Scotland so long as it didn't bother them too much in London and they had their chance to do that but the uh, Cameron I, I think probably bottled it you know instead of having the guts to do it uh, he he backed off and I think they could have got a deal there's no question they could have got a deal with salmon but you know here they are they're uh, having to go to to crush the whole kind of nationalist movement instead now with a real possibility they'll lose the union mm. Do you on the thing of the local government thing? I mean, the SNP government, presumably they continue in power even at the next election, no matter the outcome of the referendum. I mean, they, they could preempt any problems in terms of uh, further distribution or redistribution of power to local government or even a wholesale review of local democracy. Um, they don't need to wait for things to be under pressure. And, and that involves the SNP government letting go a wee bit. And because I understand there would be difficulties uh, and worries about, say, predominantly Labour councils, for example, but they really could adopt the moral high ground here and improve democracy and improve local democracy and actually set their agenda. Mm. I think that would be the way to deal with it. Yeah, and legally as well, that's the case. Just the Scotland Act, local government isn't a reserved matter. Mm -hmm. So if so, if Westminster were going to try and change the Scotland mm -hmm. Act in the way that Derek suggested, that well, under constitutional conventions, Holly would be able to veto that or say that they went up for it. So there is a still a bargaining chip in the Scottish hands on that. Sorry, I interrupted. No, I just think <laughs> SNP should or, go ahead and do it. I think it's perfectly possible that the, the Tories will take a pragmatic view to Scotland as long as they can stop it being a problem. Whether they're actually able to push that through under pressure from UKIP, etc. I don't know. But they're also villainous enough, you know. They certainly are. Labour may not have their heart in the right place, but the Tories don't have a heart at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they'd be pragmatic, but if there were radical things proposed in terms of land ownership, for example, I think they would start Ooh. getting irritated. They certainly would. <laughs> too much to lose. Well, a gentleman's yeah, Highland way. estate, something like that. You couldn't have oh, to, wow. use the to kill a few. <laughs> well, speaking of Tories, and move on, moving us on to a second kind of topic for now, is that the Tories have been hawking around businesses trying to get them to speak out against independence. There was a story in the Financial Times this week that the Ministry of Defence is urging defence companies to warn Scots about independence. And we had the standard life sort of non statement, if you actually read it it wasn't quite the way it was portrayed but um i think we'll go to derek here what did you feel about this kind of drive that's coming out from the tories now well, well i think the standard life uh, as i understand it because they're a financial services industry one of the regulatory bodies is something to do with uh, risk management uh, that's got some you know nazi type title witch finder general or something anyway there's this organization <laughs> if you if you run an institution you're duty bound to assess forthcoming risk now, there's no question, whichever side of this debate you're on, that there is risk involved for financial industries when we're talking about regulation and when we're talking about currency. So they were actually complying with what is now an industry standard. And all the financial sector companies will have to do the same thing in their, in their annual report. So to that extent, this was non-political and it was impartial. However, where uh, Standard Life get into trouble is they were deliberately briefing journalists and briefing them on a certain line, which was that there is a serious threat here. Uh, now, that to me takes them out of the impartial side and puts them right front of house. And when you look at the membership of some of their board, frankly, you know, these are just London city, old fashioned unionist people who's, uh, if you look at the results as well, you know, even when, was it a 13% or 17% drop in profits? But guess what? The boss made four million pounds last year. This is a company which in previous, uh, I think last year, sacked staff and cut the benefits to customers. And guess what? The management team got bonuses of millions of pounds each. There's about, you know, 10 of them there, I think, who, who pocket the money. I mean, you can see where there's an, uh, that's what greed is for. The kind of avarice is what drives the, a lot of their thinking. I mean, you know, it's it hardly surprising that they're not altruistic when it comes to politics and they're looking after their own interests. Uh, I just think, you know, that, that's, that the whole system is based on that. Bonuses are a motivation to make more money uh, because of it, it's designed to be greedy. And therefore, it's inevitable, I think, when it comes to politics, where they're going to where they're going to place themselves. But although the, the statement was neutral, it was spun deliberately by them, not just by the journalists as being political. 
Uh, I think what was disappointing was a lot of the presentation of it in the media failed to ask any critical questions mm -hmm. at all. For example, what would it cost you to move to London? I mean, yes. if you had to get office space for 5,000 people, what would that cost you? Would your, you know, would your uh, shareholders be happy? How much will it cost you in redundancy fees to, to do that? And, and the other point I understand which is technical is that if there is a yes vote and Scotland becomes independent, in order to trade in what will then be, quotes, a separate, if not a foreign country as such, in England, you will have to have a main office. I mean, if you look, for example, at Canada, where uh, Standard Life also operate, they have a main office in Montreal, and I think another office in Alberta or somewhere. But in order to trade and to be regulated in a country, you must have a main office. And that, I think, is what they would probably move down there. In other words, the HQ can stay in Edinburgh and a lot of the jobs could stay there, but th they would be obliged to set up something else in England in any case. William, what do you think about the idea, you know, they're going around all the businesses trying to drum up support for the union? I'm sure they are. And I'm sure they're willing to take any statement and, and have it spun any way in the BBC and the other media that they possibly can. The Willie Walsh interview was fascinating because it now looks as if uh, what about Scotland then is tacked on to the end of every interview. And uh, it may have been a slight surprise to the interviewer to find that Willie Walsh was actually pretty well neutral in the whole thing and indeed thought it might be uh, a bit of an advantage. Of course, that was then spun as he just wants independence because his air passenger duty will be cut. But it's going to be there every time we speak to anybody in the business sector now. And yes, there are going to be other manufactured statements coming up. I'm waiting for weird pumps to come up quite soon. I dare say it'll be on Thursday to give Joanne some ammunition for First Minister's questions. And it's just going to turn into this enormous bonfire of tit for tat as people either come out as neutral or pro, but mostly they're going to be raising slight questions. Because let's face it, independence has its risks. Of course it does. And any company worth its salt is going to have to take account of those risks. But that doesn't necessarily mean that on the 19th of September, they're all going to immediately vanish south in a giant pantechnicon. Um, <laughs> we're going to get the chance to prove ourselves to businesses that we are a good place to do business. They're not going to go to the expense of doing all that moving about and killing jobs left, right and centre without giving us the chance to prove that they should indeed stay. And it's that's not going to be very difficult given all the um, advantages and resources we've got. But in the meantime, we've got to put up with this blizzard uh, and it's going to muddy the waters of the debate as a whole because it is going to play with the don't knows a little bit. And uh, I, I don't think the Vox Pops and the BBC were all just manufactured. I think it will. It, it's one of the things that will cause genuine disquiet and that we have to work out a way as, yes, supporters of damping down and bringing a sense of perspective to. And Carolyn, you've always been a fan of naked, unfettered capitalism. So um, <laughs> is, um, is, uh, uh, is the possibility of a weapons company selling, saying no to independence likely to convince you? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I, 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 there's two points about this whole thing. One, I don't think there's an awful lot of people in Scotland who think that any uh, government or country that we live in should be beholden to these huge big companies and doff our caps and say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for jobs. But the, the idea that capitalism will stop being capitalism just because we'll get independence, much as I would like that to be the case, I don't think is going to happen. Um, so the businesses will act in their own self-interest and I think that the number Numbers don't add up in terms of businesses just all flying away, like was has been said, the costs involved in, in flying away would be overwhelming because Scotland is actually quite a profitable place for capitalists to work. But I also think that this may well play in undecided people's fears, but I think it's a very fine balance because I think it's quite unedifying to see politicians almost jumping with joy, gleefully, mm -hmm. when the next business says we're going to walk away and this might, there might be 500 job losses, 1,000 job losses, 2,000 job losses. Ha, 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 that does your argument in. Isn't, isn't that a mistake for the Labour Party, Caroline? 
Sorry? I mean, it, well, isn't that a mistake strategically for Labour to be seen to be jumping with glee yeah. and gloating along with yeah. the, the Tories and, and the capitalists instead of saying, you know, we will do whatever we can to preserve jobs in Scotland? Yeah, they're not talking. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's the whole thing about what happens after the negotiations as well. You know, what, what it will be quite everything they're saying just now tends to indicate as there's a yes vote that the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives as British wide parties will go in behind Westminster in negotiations for an independent Scotland to preserve the interests of the rest of the UK as opposed to arguing for an equal sharing of assets, for example, to the benefit of Scottish people. So I don't think we've got short memories. I think people will remember that. Mm. It doesn't look good, does it? No. <laughs> in, term, in terms of sounding as if, you know, you'd prefer to be on the other side of the wall that they imagine we'll erect. Uh, I think that seems a strange thing for some for some a Scottish politician mm-hmm. to do. There was also on the Labour front, I don't know if any of you saw on what day, it was the day, that, the day after David Cameron and his cabinet came up to Aberdeen, but the front page of the Daily Record ran a sort of, oi, Cameron, you know bugger off scurry away or something to that effect that they said i thought that was interesting because Mm -hmm, uh, the mm -hmm. point that derek was making there you do see quite a lot of of, of apparent enthusiasm for some of labor's you would have thought natural enemies making political points which damage Mm -hmm. the Mm nats and i thought it was Mm -hmm. interesting to see that the daily record clearly said you know listen cameron listen we're not going to celebrate your 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 appearance here i thought that was a change of tone Um, they're about selling papers as well and i think that brings up another issue where people People, working class people who are more likely to buy the Daily Record and the Sun are more likely to vote for independence and they won't keep selling papers. So I think there's a bit of that in there as well. Mm. So who's the still... paper is going to be first to turn? <laughs> <laughs> the one that thinks it'll, get, it'll sell more papers. <laughs> I'm such a cynic. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that's um, an impossible position that the first one that thinks it's going to make money from it will turn. But um, so if I could just come back to Carolyn there for a moment, because I believe you've got the Women for Indie report coming out soon. So would you like to um, explain first a bit about what the project was and then tell us or give us a preview of the report? Well, we were formed uh, with the main objective of making sure women's voices were heard, whether they supported independence or not, because despite being 52% of the population generally, apart from the odd exception, like on Tuesday night, women aren't up front necessarily in the debate and the issues being talked about aren't necessarily what women want to talk about. And also some of the things we discussed earlier about methods and adversarialism, turning people off. People get in the habit of doing politics in the basis of let's have a public meeting, come out to a meeting, which it's built in to get more men turning up. And then in, in big meetings, um, just the nature of the society that we live in, the men are more likely to talk and women start asking questions towards the end. So we wanted to create a space for women to be able to talk. And that's what we've been doing, conducting listening exercises and gathering information about what women are saying. And it, it's such a stark contrast, you know, when you do it that way, how much women talk, how much information you get from women. I did a listening exercise in Clyde Bank just a couple of weeks ago and talked and talked and talked and talked for two hours uh, with a small break and I ended up with 17 sheets of handwritten notes afterwards about what they were saying. Whereas if you go to you know, a yes meeting and they're well-intentioned and organised, you maybe get three women speaking a couple of sentences each at each public meeting. You know, so it really is quite stark. And I don't think anybody, I mean, there are polls being conducted and women have been asking questions, but they're all very much set questions, kind of closed questions. What do you think of this? Yes or no? Blah, blah, blah. Whereas we've tried to give women space to talk and ask quite open questions. And the issues that they want to talk about, what comes across more than anything is the sense of values and community and the sense that independence has to be for a purpose. It's not about self-interest in terms of the economy. It's about a concern for community, a concern for family and wanting things to be better. And there are risks with independence. There are huge risks with staying within the United Kingdom. What women want to know is that in the short term, if there are risks and there might be a price to pay in terms of the transition period, is it going to be worth it? Um, and And that's where we have all have an interest, I think, in just explaining the amazing opportunity that a new democracy can offer us, the opportunity that we'll never get with the UK of actually 
writing a new constitution, for example, that enshrines values that just open, opens up so much potential and <laughs> stressing over and over and over and over again the difference between power and policy and getting the power to have the opportunity to have the policies that we actually want rather than those that are determined in London, whether it's a Labour government or not, because a Labour government policy is determined by their self-interest in getting elected again, which means they need to satisfy the voters in England, predominantly the southeast of England. So no matter whether they were guaranteed even a Labour government in 2015, we need to get the message across that in terms of what women want in Scotland, according to what we're discovering, it's just not on the cards. I I was just going to observe, I mean, there's this thing about whether women are engaging or not. I mean, clearly women are engaging, but uh, I noticed on my blog, my estimate is something like 40% of the responses I get are from women. And that actually, that that level is rising as well. And I I wonder whether that is a kind of, you know, tiny straw in the wind that, uh, you know, I'm getting 10,000 hits on average a day. And, you know, 40 percent of that is coming from 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 women. Uh, perhaps there's a kind of accelerated process, you know, that's going to kick in now and we'll, we'll you know, see women mm-hmm. but kind of openly engaging more. You know, because I, I think, you know, guys, I don't know, what seem to be more kind of confident or upfront. Yeah, and, and give it, it give depends it a... <laughs> weird as well. You know, you might not be women might not be as visible. Um, mm-hmm. engaging but it depends on the medium that you're w- looking for them to be engaged in they are engaged talking with their friends and family mm-hmm. they are engaged in their workplaces they are engaged at bus stops and on trains and in the street they, they're t- you know, women and me are talking about it all the time but they won't necessarily go to a public meeting they won't necessarily stop at a street stall even so i do think that politics in general, whether it's party politics or whether it's campaigning politics. Um, and, and some groups are dealing with this. You know, there are definitely better methods being developed on the left, particularly in amongst, you know, and in, in pioneered by feminists, really, about different ways that you get people involved in politics that aren't exclusive and don't reinforce the existing kind of power relations in, in, in society. And I think mainstream politics really needs to catch up with that. You were making the point earlier about the way that the debate in Scotland tonight is conducted very adversarial and all the rest of it. There's just, there's no excuse for it, really. You know, they could sit a number of people down in a circle and have a conversation. And, and it's a very simple thing to do, but there's a habit of constantly putting it forward in those kind of adversarial terms because generally that's what men, I'm not saying that all men, including yourselves, think this, but they think that's how politics should be conducted. And it's not a recipe to get anybody involved. It's not a recipe to to help the public enjoy it. I mean, we've all just talked about how awful that debate was on Tuesday and the one with Sarwa was probably even worse. Um, But just to throw one in there, you mentioned the Constitution, Carolyn. And this mm-hmm. this is for everyone, uh, Andrew. Said, but would anyone like to see a fifty-fifty rule, male-female, in that constitution in a new Scottish Parliament? I think that's an interesting point. I think I'd I'd probably go for it. But I'd be interested to know what you would think about that. Do you mean in terms of uh, MSPs yeah, or something yes, like that? Yes. 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 Yeah, I don't know how you do it. I suppose I'm not sure. There probably are practical mechanisms, but I don't know how you'd ensure. As, as an outcome, I suppose you can, you can you can filter the process earlier on in the stream and say particular candidates uh, have to, you know, particular seats will be run, contested by female candidates. I know the Greens do that as well, but I don't know how you would enforce that in terms of outcome. It's quite simple, really. Uh, is it? I'm just being a half with. It's perfectly probable. You can die. What you need to what what you need to ensure is that the process is open and transparent and democratic from the start. The Labour Party get into bother because they have ways of parachuting people in, um, and the way that they approve candidates and and everything. What you need is to identify how you're going to do it from the start. So it's very clear to everybody that, like the SSP, for example, we we did it with the regional lists. And the way that we did it was to make sure that it would be different according to how many seats that you were expecting or projecting how you how you, how you would do it for. But the, for the list specifically, we had a zipped system, mm. and we, there was four regions we, that were identified. We'd have a man at the top of the list, and then it would be zipped thereafter. 
in four regions where it was identified that there would be a woman at the top of the list. But also in terms of where man, a man was and where a woman was, we looked at the regions in terms of the prospects of mm-hmm. actually being elected. That was before any actual individuals were identified or people were identified who might be the man or the woman at the top of the list. And then it was an open election thereafter. The problem is when it's identified as being a woman-only seat by an executive and after a by-election, for example, has been declared, which is what's happened in Falkirk, and that whole debacle, because then it's it, then it is seen as being anti-democratic. And that way of doing it is anti-democratic, but it is possible to have equal representation and address inequality and be democratic. It's just no, I, political. I, I... Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I was just thinking about about what Michael was asking about it in the context of, of the Constitution, say. Oh, yeah. Um, and I I can see all the the system you just described is obviously uh, works and 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 is a good a good way of uh, some people would think anyway. I know it's contem- con- it's debated in the SNP whether it's a good thing or not. But I just thought about constitutionally how you could how yeah. you could enshrine that. Um, well, Ramanda did it. Did they? I have to have a look and see, yeah, see what how they did it. it. It's, in the, it's in the Rwandan constitution. Um, and I think just rather than leaving it up to political parties, it says, you know, you could have a minimum 40%, for example, um, and you say to parties, you have to have mechanisms, democratic mechanisms mm. that will deliver, you know, at least 40% women. Um, so that you're not kind of... Uh, you're not waiting until the parties uh, nominate their candidates and then have an election and say, oh, hold on a wee mm. minute, we've got 80 men and 20 women, we'll need to readjust this. Mm. You know, it's about getting the mechanisms in place so that you know that you're going to get that minimum outcome at the end of it. And the, I think parties would have to be compelled to do it because, in my experience, just because of self-interest of men who, mm-hmm. particularly men who already have positions, it's a wee bit like the... Labour MPs just now who um, are frightened of losing their jobs in Westminster or Lords or whatever they're going to the vested interest are going to try and hang on to their positions, you know. Is, isn't it just as important, though, if you want women um, into politics, to make make things easier for women? I mean, there's it just is a, a fact, I think, that uh, it's really tough for women to kind of, if, especially if they've, you know, got a family. How do you deal with that? You know, you need to make it much more fluid. So it's, it's a kind of it's almost like a no-brainer, you know. Uh, if you, it doesn't matter what your household situation is. If you want to go into politics, it will be taken care of. You know, you can, you will be allowed to manage that, and you can, you know, come, come and go. You can be in perhaps for one, uh, one term, uh, come out again. It's what I hate is this idea that there's this big group of men sitting like crows, you know, who are there yeah. for twenty years yeah. and nothing yeah. ever moves yeah. or changes. It should be much more fluid. Yeah. And you know, you could maybe say that you, uh, you know, as as what women do with their career, that for the first four or five years they will be basically at home. That's their choice, and then they will back into politics. It just it seems to me it's like uh, you know, like the housing market. If you don't get a foot on the ladder, you never get in. And I think that's Wrong. I think I think that's I think there's a whole lot of things that you would need to do, and a big bit of it is cultural change. It relates again to the debate between Nicola Sturgeon and and, and Joanne Lamont. I mean, although uh, the SSP uh, did deliver a 50-50 mechanism, it didn't unfortunately <laughs> change the sexist culture in the SSP, which uh, played out uh, very dramatically thereafter. So, so it's not a panacea, and I, I wouldn't suggest it's a panacea, nor is it something that everybody in Women for Independence would say that they wanted, but it needs to be something that's on the table, and I, I would support it, but it would need to go along with a whole lot of other things. I did, um, I participated in the People's Gathering last year that the Electoral Reform Society organised, and there were a lot of other associated things discussed. Interestingly, 50-50 was just accepted, and it was nothing like oh, the controversy. Right. It was nothing like the controversy that it sparked in the SSP or would spark in other political parties. It was um, it was quite interesting, but it wasn't seen as a panacea. And things like secondments from work, for example, uh, people worry about job insecurity mm-hmm. and what happens to them if they're only in for one term, for example. So having secondments, having more of that fluidity, here, um, here. being able to return to a, a career easily, but challenging that it's a women's problem in terms of the caring and children and family mm-hmm. anyway, yep. you know, and, and accepting that men should be working six 
60, 70, 80 hours a week. We need to change the whole culture for everybody. And again, the Nordic countries, Iceland and, and Norway are at the top of the list for dealing with that. They've got much shorter working weeks. They've got much um, greater quality of life for men and women who who have families, um, better career breaks, all, all of that stuff. Um, because... <laughs> I'm quite contradictory sometimes because although I support 50-50, when I talk to women friends about possibly standing for the parliament, I wouldn't say that my experience of being in the parliament was an entirely positive one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, and um, yeah. because all the other barriers are still there, you know, mm. um, so it's, it's difficult. It's not going to happen overnight. Can I just say, as, as that conversation mostly whooshed over my head in a high pitch that I don't have a command of detail, um, I think 50 50 has got to be good. Um, I think it probably should go in the Constitution, but then there's going to be a lot of practical stuff, as you've just amply demonstrated, mm. uh, getting it to be a realistic option for women to be involved to that extent. And yeah, making the way open. But of course, this is one of the things with, with independence we can think about and do and actually work out from scratch without all the baggage that we've had in the past. Definitely. And I shall now, I shall, I shall now retire without <laughs> having to actually venture any more facts on this one. Okay, well, I was actually <laughs> going to come to you for first for our final story because apart from, thank you. <laughs> apart from <laughs> apart from the the week of uh, Lament's comment and the corporate bullying that we've had, another big story this week it's been the week of crowdfunding. Um, with Wings Over Scotland reaching a hundred grand at the drop of a hat almost. There's a Labour for Independence have made some money. There's a project in the Scottish Borders that have got some something together. There's the, the Glasgow Debate Project. Um, there's, a, there's a film on the go. Someone's crowdfunding a film, a documentary about Scottish independence. Uh, so, William, what do you think about all this? Well, uh, I, I thought it was a fairly impressive show of muscle by the Wings of Scotland supporters, and it shows actually how central within the, the online, yes, debate Wings Over Scotland has now become, quite apart from its, its reader numbers going pretty well through the roof. This was just their, um, it was a slightly more ambitious target that Stuart Campbell had set this year. Last year, he had a couple of things he wanted to do, and, and also he needs to be funded as, as this is his full-time job for a year. But this year, he had some more ambitious things in mind, such as a, a wee blue book, I think it's called, 32 to 48 pages of the main points for fairly wide distribution, something a wee bit more palatable and a wee bit more easy to digest than the white paper. So that was one of the things. And he's got various other campaigns and events uh, that he wanted to suggest we, that uh, could be organised. And uh, so he set a target of 53,000. That was going to be 50,000 plus the little bit that Indiegogo takes for, for running the whole campaign. And uh, he bust this within eight and a half hours, I think, and has gone on and on and on since, to the extent that he's now got 100,000, which scared the willies out of a lot of uh, no people, to the extent that... Um, the estimable Ewan McComb um, had a wee bit of a, a joust with Stuart Campbell online on Twitter, uh, saying that well, basically this is all faked. You, you know, you're, you're you're taking you can take Indiegogo money immediately, and you're taking it out and you're putting it back to make your total look bigger. Um, something I think the Labour Party probably did after 1997 with some of its public spending commitments. But let's not go <laughs> there. Um, I mean, it's, it's a nonsensical thing to claim because you'd just be paying fees to this Indiegogo company through the roof. Uh, and it, it was clearly nonsense, but um, Ewan tried to spin it for a while. And then, just to rub it in, there was a post in Wings of Scotland saying, well, you've given us all this money, and now here are these other things. There's the Labour for Independence, which is a wee bit short of its target. There's the Borders, the Yes Borders whole campaign really quite a lot further short of its target and the, the Glasgow debate that guests wants to have um, putting up speakers even if the no campaign doesn't want to provide them effectively and these three were just laid before the wings readership and they were gone within a day all the targets had been met and uh, this just goes to show I think some of the, the the energy and enthusiasm and commitment that's in there and that's what does scare 
the no campaign because they don't have a grassroots campaign like that. They simply don't. And um, theirs, as was demonstrated in that little short piece on BBC television yesterday, theirs is is much more of a computerized thing where it's it's, it's tick boxes and let's let's go for where the demographic is with a large computer system called yes Patriot, marvelous name for that. Um, mm. They just can't compete with that and. It's that, if anything, which is going to win the campaign for yes, I think. And I am looking forward to the film. Are you talking about the uh, Scotland Yet film? Uh, is that the one? You yeah, meant? yeah. Yes, that's that got fully funded, and I'm hoping to see that around about July. And that, knowing the standard of the stuff that the two guys Jack have brought out in the past, Jack Foster mm. and uh, Christopher, Jack Foster Silver, and Christopher Silver. That's right. It was, it, I'd forgotten Jack Foster's name temporarily. Sorry, Jack. But I've remembered it now. Um, that's going to be fantastic. And it's just another example of what can be done. And uh, maybe this is the future. Let's just see. Well, I, can I I think it's uh, can I just leap in there and say I think it's really it's very impressive. But I just want to stir a little fly into the ointment is giving somebody a hundred thousand pounds activism and on the ground work not necessarily and i only have i i, I mean nothing uh, ill in stuart's direction in this direction but i have only one anxiety which is about this which is one that it might give people the impression that they're involved in activism when they're not really involved in activism um and it might also defer funds away from other kind of yes things which actually are doing the on the ground stuff in the way that Stuart Campbell unfortunately can't do because he lives in down in Bath. So I just wonder about that. Is there is there a risk that it, it feels like a groundswell? And it is very impressive. It's profoundly impressive and frankly mental. I think. Um, and it'd be wrong to say that it wasn't like that. But is there is there maybe an ambivalence here about the phenomenon of clicktivism? Could be, but I, I think the way that uh, Stuart has has run this particular one, giving clear goals and then directing people to some of the other things that were just needing funded that, that he knew about um, shows I think is, is at least uh, taking the attitude to, to try to spread it about and there is also, also the thing yes that if you just give money you think well that's my job done I'll just give up now but that's not the ethos of wings either so it really depends how you run it I think. I was going to ask Derek do you think this falls into the kind of old media new media narrative or is it more that it's exceptional circumstances with the referendum coming up? Well, I think, I think William was making a point there that uh, the No campaign don't have this. No, they don't, but they've got the mainstream media. And I mean, and that's that's the problem. Uh, and I think that's why uh, this has been so successful, the crowdfunding, because it's it really is a mark of the failure of the mainstream media, which to a degree has been shameful in Scotland uh, when, when we've reached this critical and historic point. But the media that we've relied on, you know, in some cases, actually, for a couple of centuries, has, I think, has let us down rather badly, has, has really proved to be very limited in its scope, failed to scrutinise, uh, been been led by the nose and uh, by literally by the nose um, in order to <laughs> um, to follow a narrative, you know, somebody else's narrative. And, and I hear it all the time as a professional journalist where the obvious questions are simply not being put. Uh, so I, I think that this is a kind of standing indictment of the, the newspapers and, and the broadcasters, that this is the reaction. People are aware that they're not getting, they're not getting nourishment, uh, intellectual nourishment. But it's not just about basic information, which is people people indicate that they don't have. There's lots of information. There's mountains of it. It's more, I think, about how it's presented and how it engages with them. And I think a lot of it is just failing. And they're looking at sites like Stuart's, which is fantastic because it's, you know, it's clever, it's witty and it's, 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 it lacks reverence. And, and far too much of modern Scotland, I think, is just deferential. It's why people are afraid when a big company says, you know, we'll up sticks in a way. I mean, we should be saying F off then. You know, that should be the attitude. Who the hell do you think you're lecturing? This is not run by you. This is a democracy. And we'll decide what kind of country we're going to have. And I think too many people just kind of bend the knee too quickly. And that is definitely reflected right across the, the mainstream media. I should say, by the way, that uh, I'm involved as well in a, a project which I'm hoping to, uh, which some of us are going to launch soon. And we've been uh, seeking funding uh, privately, not through crowdfunding. And so far, I mean, that has also been, in our terms, really successful, as in tens of thousands of pounds. Mm. And Carolyn, what do you feel about the crowdfunding um, problem? Uh... I, 
agree with a lot of what um, Derek is saying. My, my concern is that sometimes things are funded and they reinforce the existing kind of inequalities that exist in society. Women for exa- independence, for example, what we could do with a hundred grand um, and we're trying to, it's in everybody's interest to persuade more women to vote yes. So I think it's a priority for the whole of the yes movement to prioritise women. Um, and Women for Independence is a lay voluntary organisation that's been formed by women who work full time and study and do other things. There's nobody paid and, you know, we've made our own website, we're running about the country, we don't get expenses for speaking anywhere or any, anything like that. You know, the official Yes campaign and groups invite us to speak um, at meetings and they think, well, it's great, let's go Women for Independence on the platform. And that's, and that's good. I'm just a wee bit concerned that they think that we're ticking the box of women and we've got a hell of a lot of women to persuade. So Women for Independence, you know, we're launching a video this week, we're launching a paper, we're having an International Women's Day Day of Action next Saturday, but it's all being done by volunteers in our free time. We're all stressed out our boxes, talking about work-life balance. I'm just a wee bit... It would be great if there was a bit of, bit of strategy about it in terms of the overall grassroots yes movement, which is very pluralistic, and that is brilliant. But what do we need to do to get a yes vote in September and where should the resources be going? And I think a significant amount of resources need to be going towards women, whether it's supporting women for independence or whether it's about the official yes campaign or other groups focusing more resources and more priority towards how we're going to get the women's vote to shift. I think that's a strategic question. And, I'm, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff on the Wing Scotland website, but persuading women, I don't think as his niche. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know that he doesn't really listen to podcasts that he's not in, so I think you'll be safe saying that. <laughs> no, I'm, only, for that. I'm only joking. <laughs> okay. But um, I think that's probably about time to wrap up for today. So uh, thanks to all our guests for coming on. Thanks, William. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. And thanks, Derek. Welcome. And I'll speak to you again soon, Andrew. I'm going to go and start Project Beer for today, I think. <laughs> the <Why? cure. laughs> as, as Homer Simpson once said, alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Indeed. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Okay, bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Speaking of, no, no, I need to do that bit again. That was crap. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> this is why we're not live. Hey, okay. <laughs>